Uh, yeah, so thanks for all waking up super early for this. Um, and I apologize for anyone who is afraid of spiders, but this, I mean, this guy's kind of cute. He's like, oh, I got, I got eyeballs and little legs. <laughs> anyway, it's early, I'm fucked up. <laughs> all right, so uh, here's my talk, and this is the coolest thing about my talk, so after you see this, you can all leave. Whoosh. All right, go look. That's it. That's that's it. Keynote. Um, so this is a talk. It's about uh, basically about my journey, uh, to put it in a cheesy way, through uh, InfoSec, my um, adventures the last uh, 10, 11 years. I can't even remember how long I've been doing InfoSec. Um, braving the wilds, your mileage may vary on the level of uh, liver damage that you may acquire through, through your career. Um, hopefully not as much as mine. So uh, just to give a little... Yeah, I made that. I made that yesterday. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a security engineer at Tumblr. Um, I am also, as it was mentioned, the adjunct professor and adjunct professor at NYU Polytechnic School of Engineering, um, where I teach computer networking, and also now I'm teaching application security because apparently uh, they think I know about that. Um, I, I ran AOL once back in 1996. Uh, FedEx was was way better. Um, so I've been kind of messing around on computers for a while. Uh, secu there are going to be a lot of animated GIFs in this talk because I do run security reactions and um, apparently that's when I'm, it's a good thing I work for Tumblr now because I actually get paid to run security, not really. Um, and I also like, uh, I also wear some pretty nice shirts. You can see that's my Windows 95 shirt up there and uh, it's uh, swag, it's pretty good. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I'm just going to do this because I always, I always talk too long and then people start throwing things at me. So what is this talk about? Um, first, let me talk about what this talk is not. Um, it's obviously 9 o'clock in the morning. You guys are probably all still, guys and gals are probably all still waking up. And um, so I'm not going to do anything. It's, this is not going to be a technical talk. I'm not going to dro drop O'Day. I'm not going to blow your minds with amazing computer uh, cracking, hacking powers. Uh, another thing that this talk is not an endorsement or a uh, disavowal of any of the companies that I mentioned in this talk or work for. Uh, it's more about my experiences because I have worked in a lot of different industries and in a lot of worn a lot of different hats. Uh, one of which was a cowboy hat that is somewhere in my apartment. Um, and. Is there anything else this talk is about? I don't know. I'll figure it out. I'm going to see, see what, what my slides say. So how did I get into computer security? Um, like I said before, I've, met, I've been messing around with computers for ver since a relatively young age, and I didn't know that you could actually do that for good. Um, mostly I was doing it to get free calculators from an online website and then reselling them at school. Wait, I didn't, I, did. I think the statute of limitations is over on that one, so I can admit that to you. Um, when I was in junior year of college, I found out about this scholarship program called uh, Scholarship for Service, or SFS, where you get two years of free school in exchange for selling your soul to the government for two years. So I was like, yeah, you know, my soul doesn't really have a whole lot of value, I'll just do that. Because I didn't know that you could do this for a living. I thought that I was going to become a web developer, which is awesome. <laughs> So, like I said, I got the scholarship for service, and I had to work for the government for two years. So, um, where did I go? I went to work for the U.S. Army. I was not in the Army. I was not a contract for the Army. I was a civilian employee for the U.S. Army. Um, what I did there, so we worked in a sort of tactical-oriented uh, unit where we were concerned with all of the networking gear that gets sent out to when, it, when a unit, uh, an army unit or whatever, is deployed. I mean, they need ways to get their maps, to get coordinates where they need to go, to get maybe any information about, you know, attacking, uh, you know, terrorist activity that's happening in the area, people who may be gearing up to attack them, people that, you know, things that they need to go look at, whatever. So when you have a lot of networking appliances, you also have attack service. And we were concerned with two things. How secure are these security networking appliances? And also, um, you know, um, we, there, I, I heard a rumor that China doesn't like us. And it's also where a lot of our um, equipment, electronics are being manufactured. I don't know if that's true or not. But um, so basically, uh, we were buying or we were getting network appliances and we were just 
breaking the shit out of them, pardon my French. Uh, so the great thing about that job was it was research centric and because we're like, hey, we're, we're protecting the uh, we're protecting the fighter, we're protecting our troops, we really didn't have to explain away too much about why we needed all of the money we needed. Uh, and then hack all the things. Uh, the, if any of you have seen my talk about hacking DLP that I do with uh, Zach Lanier or Quine on Twitter, uh, the reason that I was inspired to pick up that topic and, and do it with Zach was um, I realized from this job that just because it's a security appliance doesn't mean it's secure. Um, I wrote my first remote root exploit in this job, which at 21 years old is probably a little old for that sort of thing, but I still thought it was, I, you know, some people don't get to do that in their lifetime, so that was awesome. And I was actually doing security work straight out of school. So from college, maybe two or three months to get my interim clearance and right into this job. That's awesome. So for every job, every awesome job, there's always going to be the, you know, little shadow or the things, you know, the, the, the shine starts to wear off a little bit. Um, and like I said, this is not to, dis to disrespect any of these jobs. Every single job that I mentioned here still has some of my former coworkers still working there. So obviously, this is, I mean, this US Army is a great job. It's got job stability. Um, you know, they usually don't do layoffs for the government. Um, the problem was, and I didn't find this out until later, is the, the pay that they were giving everyone, because this is the taxpayer's dollar and we want to not, nobody likes taxes. Uh, the salaries really weren't comparable to what I was seeing in uh, private industry or, you know, for uh, corporations or whatever. Um, the other thing that is probably people kind of find shocking at first, but it kind of makes sense, is if you find a bug on a system that is, or a device that is running in a classified network, that vulnerability immediately becomes classified. Uh, and at the time, I don't know if this has changed or not, there really weren't any people with certificate or um, clearances working at companies. So you say, hey, Cisco, we found a bug. They're like, what's the bug? And we're like, can't tell you. <laughs> it's a secret. Um, we're, so that's kind of cool in one way because you have all of this ODA, but it's kind of bad in another way because you're like, the whole purpose of this was to protect our troops and now we, we know about the bugs. We sort of like, okay, you found the ODA in your pacemaker, so wrap yourself in tinfoil and hide in the closet, I guess. Um, uh, and then I'm just going to talk to you. I'm, I don't like, I, I was kind of debating whether or not to share this tale, but I want to tell you about Jake. Jake the Flake. It's not his real name, it just runs with Flake. That's, I don't know. Whatever. Jake, um, Jake was a flake. Jake uh, started to kind of not show up to work. Uh, maybe start starting out like twice a month, then once a week, then one day he just stopped showing up for work. It took us three months to get him fired. <laughs> Which, again, that's awesome if you actually do your job and you have job security, but then you see the person who comes in and is reading his newspaper all day. Hopefully, since then, it's a lot easier to get fired from government jobs I don't I don't know but that it's a little frustrating it were it was a little frustrating there but still it was an awesome job and actually the only reason that I started looking elsewhere is because uh, they uh, the government in an effort to save money does this thing called a uh, BRAC it's like a reload they basically try to consolidate army units or army bases into one so they're like yeah well, you, you guys are all gonna have to move to Maryland and I didn't want to move to Maryland. I was already living in New Jersey, and that was worse. That was bad enough. So, so I decided, to, okay, what else is out there? Uh, this is about two and a half years after I started. So, um, I and I apologize to any any Ron Paul fans. So I was like, hey, I have a clearance. Let me go work for the Federal Reserve. Is that that's the former president that that he dances like that, like in real life? It's uh, like all the time. That's how he get, like. It's like, come on, Ben, stop. Just sit down. So this was great. Um, I actually got to leverage the fact that I had government experience. And the th weird thing about the Federal Reserve is that the Federal Reserve, or at least the Federal Reserve branches, are not actually government branches. They're considered nonprofit, gov government mandated. The only thing that's actually a .gov is the board. So Federal Reserve Bank of New York is sort of like a weird hybrid of nonprofit government finance. Uh, this job was great because um, there were a lot more people my age, 
So we could go out drinking afterwards, and if everyone here probably knows that drinking is essential if you work in information security. Um, the work-life balance was great. Uh, they, the, it was actually a 35 hour work week and if you chose to work longer you could basically take either every other Friday off or work from home a bunch of days a week. So that was cool and the great thing about the job at the Federal Reserve was the bugs you find got fixed because the people in house were fixing them. Um, it was more of, it was starting to pull me away, less away from a network related stuff and more to, to application security stuff. Um, we did do some network security, but that was usually handled by other groups. Mostly we were concerned about you know, the systems that move the money around. Um, I heard that the Federal Reserve was really um, popular or is still really popular because um, when the finance crashed, they gave the money, gave all your money away. Did they do that? Oh, and also, um, unlike, and I'm going off on a tangent here, I need another sip of Red Bull, one second. Mm, that's good Red Bull. Um, so how many people here have seen Die Hard with a Vengeance? It's a good movie. Uh, you can't really steal gold out of the Federal Reserve that way. Um, not that I tried, but... Um, no, I, I, there's no, there's no tunnel that leads to the Federal Reserve underground to, that you can get the gold out of. Um, so, and also don't get locked in the vault. Um, that, I think that happened to one person one time and there's only enough air in there for like a weekend. Uh, he didn't die, he was like, they found him the next day. I don't know why he was in the vault. But um, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. The, the bad thing about it was, you know, there, there's, there's bad things about government. You know, you hear about the red tape and, and stuff and that stuff had here. Uh, basically, it was like we were kind of working a finance lifestyle, but we we're still getting paid government pay. And it was a little, you know, especially living in New York, um, it's a little expensive. Um, and we also had the same sort of thing where people, there were some people there who just kind of, um, and this is probably true for a lot of jobs. There were just some people there who just kind of checked out. They'd been there 20, 30 years, and they were just kind of in a rut. And the good thing about noticing that was I realized that I didn't ever want that to happen to me. Um, my goal was as soon as I get bored in a job, I start looking for a new job. As soon as I feel like I'm not learning anything new, I start looking for a new job. Because once this goes to mush, it's really, and I, and I'll, um, I found this out once I left this job because I was kind of becoming complacent. I was there for five years. Um, once this starts to go away, getting it back is, is kind of like, relearning how to walk after you've broken your leg. It's, it's, it, it's cram it gets crampy. It's like, there's not enough Red Bull for that. So, the Federal Reserve is uh, in the financial district area, so I just kind of walked down the street and was like, hey, hire me. No, um, but I ended up working for NASDAQ. Um, let me just tell you a few things about the financial world that um, I was, I was, found interesting. So Wolf of Wall Street, nobody does quaaludes anymore. Uh, you do not get a giant brick of cocaine when you start working for, uh, in a financial company. And the three martini lunch, um, that's only on Fridays. Uh, so this was, this job was like, this job made my brain start working. I was like, oh my God, I have to hack everything. Everything needs to be, basically NASDAQ, Kind of, I don't know if anyone heard that NASDAQ has had some security problems in the past, because um, you know that's exactly the kind of company that you want to have security problems. Is is the one of the companies that's responsible for our country's economy? Um, they kind of basically wiped the slate clean with respect to their security team and decided to kind of you know scorch the earth and, and uh, build over. So we were basically starting the security team. And that may seem frustrating, but it was actually a lot of fun. You learn a lot when you're starting a security team, especially um, from other people's fails, and then you make your own fails, which is embarrassing, but also um, it's great for the fact that you are, um, you know, it's sort of like taking the clock apart and putting it back together, and then you have a little, little gear left, and you're like, what the hell is that for? Um, and holy shit, they actually pay you money. I like money. Money's cool. Um, but the, the, the cons of, of uh, basically like buy the skin of your teeth, 
always running as fast as you can. Um, everything is super time critical. Everyone's working super hard all the time. Is that you don't really get a lot of money to do the things that you need to do. It's not like the government where you're just like APT and they're like, make it rain, make it rain. Um, also, you know, being a publicly traded company, you have to justify the money you make and the money you lose. So, if the company is doing poorly, then what is one of the first? What are the first things that get cut? The profit centers, or I'm sorry, the, the non-profit centers. You know, if you're not making your money, then you're costing them money, and which is probably true for pretty much every organization except the ones that sell you stuff, security stuff, like so, all of the cool vendors that are sponsoring us. Um, maybe I'll go work for you someday so I know what that actually feels like for people to want to give you money for security. Maybe. Uh, so there was a high burnout rate too. People, you know, when you're working 60, 70 hours a day because there's only so many people to do stuff, you tend to get really, really um, over caffeinated. <sighs> So my goal for this talk is to get through it without having a heart attack or pissing my pants, because I'm probably going to finish this can. It's like, uh, why are you all vibrating? Um, so this was a great job, but I started to get burnout, um, maybe after about two and a half years. Of, I do like working that way, which we'll talk about when we talk about where I ultimately landed up. But then I kind of was so overstressed that my logic wasn't working right, and I ended up making a bad move uh, for me. Not to say that this is a bad move for anyone. I went to back to the kind of um, I went to, to a, a large bank with a large, large security team and became a paper pusher. That was. So I can't really say a lot about this job just because it really wasn't my cup of tea. Like it's necessary to do all that stuff, you know, to make sure that people are compliant with PCI, compliant with HIPAA, compliant with whatever the hell that you need to be compliant with. Um, I didn't like it. I don't like non-technical stuff. Um, it it just goes about as well as this talk is going right now. Um, so basically, I didn't, I didn't, I, it was like, I, I kind of knew uh, maybe after about three or four months that this really wasn't for me. This was not something that I wanted. I not, and now this is why I'm not going to talk about pros and cons because this is not something that I really um, experienced enough to say that I want to talk about it. Um, because I don't think it would be fair to Citibank, I don't think it would be fair to banks in general about what the lifestyle is like there and, um, you know, what the job is like. Because working in a job that's not for you is basically like, yeah, um, I worked at Burger King when I was 17, and I really like French fries, but sometimes people yell at you. It's like, I really can't speak intelligently to that. Not implying I'm speaking intelligently now, but now I work for Tumblr. And um, as evidenced by the fact that I run security reactions and this uh, presentation is full of GIFs, uh, these are like people that, you know, kind of, we dig the kind of the same stuff, right? Uh, the other thing about Tumblr being a very small organization, it's maybe about 300 people, is that when you mess something up, when you break code or when you break the site or when you write something that's vulnerable, everyone knows who did it. Um, and that led to a very savvy culture of security. Basically, you don't want to be the, the guy or the gal who pushed the, um, you know, merged the branch in GitHub that uh, caused the whole site to be vulnerable to cross-site scripting or cross-site request forgery or whatever the bug is. Um, also, things change quickly, so you're always working on new stuff all the time. Um, one day, I will be you know, trying to get uh, more security features built into the site, so I'll actually be doing some coding. Uh, sometimes I'll be helping developers architect, developers architect uh, their own code to make sure that they're doing it securely. Sometimes they'll be messing around with uh, network stuff, working with the network team or the perimeter team to make sure that they're doing their firewall rules and their detection and everything properly. Um, sometimes they'll just be adding more submissions to security reactions. 
Um, no, my, my boss actually will sometimes say, uh, there's no, there hasn't been any updates. Can you put more GIFs in the GIF box? And I'm like, OK. Um, this, the cons of this is it's a small staff. It's a startup. We still have to prove to the world that we're capable of making money, uh, prove to our overlords at Yahoo that we're capable of making them money. Uh, so the budget stays small. We can't go out and buy and buy fancy network appliances to, or buy a WAF to put in front of our stuff, or buy you know, a fancy box to uh, detect all of, all of the bad people trying to break in, or the bad people who have maybe owned a laptop and trying to uh, move around the network. We can't do that. We have to, we basically have to make our own stuff or use open source, source stuff, which is great, but because, um, you know, there's never been any vulnerabilities in open source, source software ever, um, ever. Um, yes. Actually, one of the good things, I'll talk about, actually about a pro about Citibank. Uh, Citibank. When Heartbleed came out, Citibank was not vulnerable to Heartbleed because they don't use OpenSSL anywhere. Like, not even in, in any of their networking stuff. And I was like, all my friends are up until 3 in the morning, and I'm just like, they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, watching Netflix, eating tacos. They're like, aren't you worried about Heartbleed? I'm like, I'm more worried about this taco getting in my mouth. Bye. Also, things changing quickly is great. It's good to keep you on your toes. It's good to keep you interested in the work you're doing. But things change quickly, and you can't watch everybody. So things will get out that are bad. We got to run, try to find out who fixed it, and smack them around a bit. Um, also, you can't spend two, two weeks to a month doing your code review or your pen test. You don't have that long. Uh, you know, we have a feature that we want to get out. We want to get it out, you know, this year. We don't run as slowly as, let's say, a bank or the government where, you know, things, it's okay for things to take a while. You know, it's not like, um, okay, so the, 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 we're changing the font on the ATM. It's not like a big deal. A lot of the stuff that you work on in the bank or in the government is not really customer facing. So getting it, um, you know, get it, you, can, you can take the time to make sure that it's getting done right. That, that's not to say that we don't do things right at Tumblr. It's just that you can't have everybody waiting for the four person security team to be like, oh yeah, um, um, so this line of code is slightly um, unindented and I think that you're using parameterized queries, but I haven't read every single place that you're doing, um, talking to the database, so I'm gonna need another week to do that. And also I'd like to you know, run some, uh, what, is, what, is, what is the stuff that they, they're debating yesterday? Well, we don't have the money for dynamic analysis tools, so I guess that's a moot point. Yeah. Anyway, Tumblr's great. You should work for Tumblr, we're hiring. So I did this in emojis because I'm, I'm a woman and I love emojis. And I also work for Tumblr, I love emojis. So these are the places that I worked. And I just want to talk a little bit about the differences to kind of get away from you know, the pros and the cons and, and all of that stuff. So the first one, so we have uh, dynamics, basically how rapidly the environment changes, um, how much freedom you have to kind of do your own stuff, uh, what the security budget is like, uh, what staffing is like, you know, some places they're able to hire a little bit more easily than others. And how technical the job was. And I'm rating the technical in coffee cups and also amounts of alcohol consumed. Uh, so I, I don't think I need to really explain that further. Okay, so you can see that for um, the, the dynamicness with, CER, with uh, CERDEC, which is the part of the army that I work for in the Federal Reserve, we, it's kind of, things, things are pretty slow, which is good if you are um, not crazy attention deficit hyperactive disorder like I am, a person who drinks Red Bulls as big as her head. At NASDAQ, it was, you know, it was pretty crazy. You know, if, if something needs to get done, they want, it, they want it done. They don't want to wait around for security. It's not as crazy as Tumblr, where everything's on fire all the time, uh, which is fire, not like, oh my god, fire. And Citibank, meh, I don't know. Security budget. At the, at the Army, it was like, yeah, OK, here, have some money. Have some money. It's good. Uh, at the Federal Reserve, they, you know, even though they, control all your money, um, um, 
whether you agree with that or not. I know it's very controversial, especially amongst um, a largely libertarian crowd that computer security people tend to be. They basically was like, okay, well, we don't really need to increase our budget. It's kind of things, I put the snowman because things kind of always stayed the way it was. With Nasdaq and Citibank, they did, they did have a lot more money to throw at stuff. Um, maybe not as much as the army, but it seemed like they were, you know, if you said, we need a WAF, they were like, yeah, just WAF. get the WAF. We, we heard about that. We think it's cool. Um, so money. In Tumblr, we get, we get free pizza. I love, I love pizza, so I don't really consider that a bad thing. But, you know, we're, it's, it's not like, here, here you go, here's $100,000, go up, put... Um, DLP in, in every single network you own. Uh, staffing. Uh, in the Army, it was, it was a little difficult to get fresh blood in, to get new people in. There tended to be people who had been working there for 20 or 30 years, which is great uh, that people love their job so much that they would stay there that long, but also it's hard to get people because of the whole clearance thing. Um, hackers don't tend to be the most mentally stable bunch of people. Um, what? Where am I? What the? Oh, shit. Okay. Um, okay. Um, at the Federal Reserve, it was it was a little bit better, and it was also, like I said before, a lot more diverse. A lot more people my age. A lot more people who like to go out drinking and do karaoke after work. Um, but it was, you know, not crazy staffing. The money was pretty much the same. We said, okay, we have. 10 people on this team, 10 people on this team. That's good, somebody left, we got one more person. We never, never really anything really growing or shrinking. At NASDAQ, like I said before, I put the little baby face there because we were kind of rebuilding the way that NASDAQ was doing security. Um, so it was a lot of just very fresh, uh, straight off the streets, hey, you're a hacker. We, we heard ha hackers are, are good for security, so come work for NASDAQ. Um, at Citibank, City, Citibank's security team, rightfully so, is freaking huge. Like, in my office alone, and Citibank has all, like all, like has at least three offices in New York that I know of, um, and then offices all over the world. In my office alone, there was at least thirty people working on security, because I mean they got the. Wire transfers, they got all the ATMs, they got the personal banking, they have the corporate banking, they have um, you know, the secret cabal of reptilian overlords that control our nation's economy. What? No. Um, uh, Tumblr, everyone loves cats. That's all I have to say about that. We also like dogs too, but um, cats are pretty cool. Uh, we also have, we, we're not allowed to have pets at the office anymore, which is really disappointing, but we do have two turtles uh, that often escape. And that's a little concerning in New York because I'm sure you've all heard about what happens when turtles escape and um, are exposed to pizza. And the technical, so, so the Army was super technical, the Federal Reserve was a little bit less technical, but we, we still, you know, had, has, has some party times. NASDAQ was drink a bunch of coffee, stress the hell out, drinks a bunch of martinis, calm down, drink a bunch of coffee. It was, it was pretty fun. The martinis were usually after work. We don't, don't like having drunk people touching um, computer stuff when it's a tr stock market. Uh, Citibank, one coffee cup, because not technical much at all, other than knowing what computers do and why it's bad to mess with them. And Tumblr, all the coffee, all the beer, all the time. Um, I'm actually, I actually came here, I'm missing the hack day, which is basically started at noon yesterday. People stay at the office, sleep at the office, basically get drunk and write crazy um, features that will most likely never get into the site. Um, last hack day, I wrote a, of course I did, I wrote a breathalyzer tool. I had a little mini bit breathalyzer. I wrote a tool so that you couldn't post the Tumblr. Um, I, I made two modes. I made, um, you know, normal mode or the mode you expect, where you can't post the Tumblr if you are if your blood alcohol is above the legal limit. And then I put beast mode, where you could only post the Tumblr if your blood alcohol was over the legal limit. It was fun. I like it. <laughs> and that's how security reactions works. Um, 
I want to talk a little bit about vulnerability management, because I know there was a little bit about debate over there. And I apologize again for the spider, but come on. He's so cute. He's got sunglasses. Oh, yeah. Spider. Um, I did mention a little bit about how vulnerability management worked at the Army. Oh, good. I'm actually, I actually made 10 slides, and I'm like, making them, making them last, man. Uh, so you know, you find a vulnerability when you're in something that lives within the Army network, it immediately becomes classified, and that becomes a pain in the butt to deal with. Uh, at NASDAQ, the things that we usually looked at were all internally built. Um, the, we didn't really worry, concern ourselves with the networking stuff. That was usually another team. So we were able usually to get that stuff fixed. It may take three months. It may take six months. But it usually eventually got fixed. Um, there was also a, in, I would say, NASDAQ, Federal Reserve, and Citibank, that whole kind of, the, the, one of the biggest things we had to combat was the, let's just uh, accept the risk on that one, because we don't want to fix it mentality. Uh, that is something that is really hard to combat. Um, I find that the best way to combat that mentality, um, or at least what worked for me in those last three jobs, was the uh, proof of concept, or GTFO. Uh, mentality where they're like, oh, yeah, that's not really bad. I mean, what could they do? And I'm like, boom, what's that on your screen? You just wired me $5. Now, go fix that while I buy myself a taco. I like tacos. Um, at Tumblr, Tumblr is the only place I've worked for that actually had a bug bounty or has a bug, bug bounty. Um, Tumblr does encourage people to hack on their stuff and tell us about it. Uh, Tumblr, also, you know, if you, fix, if you find something internally, people tend to get really upset about it. Not upset in terms of like crying or feeling bad, but upset about, man, I can't believe I did that. That sucks. OK, I'll, let me fix it. You know, let me uh, repent for my sins and correct the mistake I made, which is cool. Or not, I don't know. Um, all right, so I will got this dog here. He's, oh man. I just, I'm just going to, so this talk is mostly just be me like commenting on how cute all my gifts are. Um, does anyone have any questions? I know I kind of just rambled a lot, but, or you can just find me afterwards and berate me. All right. No one? Bueller? Any, I mean, I can't tell you at like the secrets of the Federal Reserve. Like, are they really run by uh, like a cabal of international uh, Illuminati people? But um, I can neither, neither confirm or deny that. All right. So if you want to find me uh, either in person, well, you know, you know what I look like in person. If you'd like to cyber stalk me a little bit, I'm Aloria on Twitter. Uh, my Tumblr is securityreactions.tumblr.com. My sad blog where I talk about my sads is traverse.al. Yes, that's an Albanian domain name. I don't remember how I got that. Um, and if anyone knows what this reference is to, my email address, George Sims at Juked My Chronics, um, I owe you a drink because nobody gets that reference. Anyone? Anyone? Stephen Glass. Yay, Stephen Glass. He's trying to become a lawyer. <laughs> because it's, so Stephen Glass, since I do have like five minutes, or more left. Stephen Glass was a guy back in the late 90s, I believe. Yeah, 98 is when they found out. He basically fabricated all of his articles. Like, they were supposed to be true, but he just made most of them up. Um, the one that he got, he got busted for was he talked about a hacker named Ian Rustle. Ian Rustle apparently broke into the website of a company called Juked Micronics. Uh, got and posted the salary of all the employees along with pictures of naked ladies and the text, the big bad bionic boy has been here, baby. Uh, Juke Micronics didn't want to um, hire a consultant to fix the bugs, so they hired Ian Rustle instead. And now that I'm saying that, I can't believe that anyone thought that was a true story. Um, so this guy, Adam Pennenberg, was like, that sounds like a load of crap, and busted him. There was no Ian Rustle, there was no George Sims who was the CEO of Juke Micronics. And Juke Micronics' webpage was an AOL members webpage, because that's, that's how we do. All right, anyway, thank you, everyone. Um, bye. <laughs>